This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 81. This week, we learn all about the Canadian Forces Snowbirds Demonstration Squadron, who they are, what they fly, where they perform, and why they do it all. And who better to explain all this than a former Royal Canadian Air Force FA-18 pilot and two-time snowbird, Robert Mitchell. And what better way to enter into this episode than with the Royal Canadian Air Force March Pass song. Hit it. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here is your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello. And if you've been listening to the podcast a while, you know that we typically have a guest that joins us each episode to talk about the subject. And then we have a past guest or some other guest co host to help out. Well, today we're going to combine those roles. And joining us via Zoom is Mr. Rob Mitchell, call sign Scratch. How are you doing, Scratch? I'm very well, Jello. Awesome. Fantastic to be here. Oh, thanks. Yeah, this is good. So yeah, I'm going to rope you in. You're going to be like the co-host, the guest. You're going to do it all, buddy. So uh, let's see. And we're going to talk today about the Royal Canadian Air Force Snowbirds. Does that sound good? That's awesome. That's right up my alley, right? Great. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're going to get to know you in just a second. First, some announcements. If you missed last week's AC-130 episode, you may want to go back and check it out. We received a lot of positive feedback on the show and our guest, Buck. However, it was brought to my attention afterwards that during the notoriety portion of the discussion, Buck and I failed to list the 2013 movie Olympus Has Fallen, where a rogue gunship attacks Washington, D.C., with guns protruding from both sides of the fuselage, which, of course, we learned last week is incorrect. It's only on the port side. I watched a scene from that, and the CGI was fairly evident, which I guess is part of the reason Rotten Tomatoes didn't think much of the movie. But otherwise, I had not seen it, didn't even know about it, thanks to those of you who brought it to my attention. With air shows canceled, along with so many other events this year, some of you here in the States have been lucky enough to have the combined Blue Angels and Thunderbird formations fly over your hometown in their ongoing tribute to frontline workers. Well, the Snowbirds, subject of today's show, of course, they're doing the same. They're crossing Canada to salute the citizens doing their part to fight the spread of COVID-19. This unique mission is being aptly dubbed Operation Inspiration, and you can find more details on the Canadian Forces Snowbird Facebook page. This past week, we released a new musing. It's from our teammate, Rich Cooper, and it's called Reality Check. This article follows up our Advanced Training Methods episode a couple shows back and reflects on Rich's time photographing and documenting the 2018 Farnborough International Air Show. Check that out on fighterpilotpodcast.com and then go to the Musings tab. Also, as everyone knows, our Facebook groups are growing like mad. So if you're looking for a place to hang out where you might be able to share some of your aviation photography interests, or if you are an aspiring aviator, or you just want to hang out in our ready room, well, come over to the Facebook page for the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Go to the groups section and check that out. As well, on our website, We have a shop page that our teammate Yannick is constantly updating. We've got t-shirts, hats, we've got other merchandise there as well, a bunch of books. And on some of those books, if you hover over them, you'll see an option for a review. Now, I'm no professional book reviewer, but if I've read the book, I'll give you my thoughts on it. It's usually military aviation books, so check that out if you're looking for some cool Fighter Pilot Podcast merchandise or a new book for your library. All right, Scratch, we generally cover listener questions before we get to the interview, and I have some listener questions specific for you. So I think what we'll do is we'll save those to the end, and we'll kind of cover those uh, right before we wrap up. Does that sound good? That's perfect, yeah. Awesome. Cool, man. All right, well, hey, you know the drill. You've listened to the show. We need to get to know you first, and some folks might already know you because you've got a presence outside of the Snowbirds and Hollywood and other teams. But let's start at the beginning. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And what did you do in the military? And what are you doing now? 
So the short answer is I'm Canadian. I grew up in Victoria, British Columbia, not far from where I'm living right now in Vancouver. I grew up a son of an Air Force pilot and the grandson of an Air Force fighter pilot. All right. You know, I grew up with aviation in my blood. My grandfather was a Spitfire pilot in World War II, and my dad flew F5s and Voodoos and a number of different instructors for many years. So I grew up with the uh, Air Force blood in me. It wasn't very long in my life before I realized that I wanted to fly jets as well. Mm -hmm. So that's my thing. I, I went to the University of Victoria, University of Manitoba, and I did some schooling in the Air Force as well. And it's all culminated into, you know, this crazy fast 20 year career and now this new career. What did you fly mainly in the uh, Canadian Air Force? I pipelined what we call so right out of pilot training. I went to fly through the F-5 program for fighter lead-in training. And then I flew three tours on F-18s. Oh, cool. And then we're probably going to get two tours on the, the Royal Canadian Air Force Snowbirds as well. Yeah, awesome. What rank did you retire at? I was a lieutenant colonel okay. and had a very interesting offer. I, I was very privileged and very honored to be selected for the rank. And they were telling me that, you know, I was on this list to all things being equal. I was going to be a general and go on and do uh, different things, but <laughs> you know, I, I decided to do something else. You had other interests. Yeah. That's a funny one. It's like, hey, look, dude, if you don't screw it up, this is where we see you going. So it's only yours to lose. But in your case, you said, no, thanks. So that's interesting. And since you retired, which, uh, what year did you retire, by the way? I retired in 2010, it was oh. almost exactly 10 years ago already. And since then, you've still been hanging out with some teams and spending a little time in Hollywood, right? I have. And so I, I really did get out. You know, I had a wonderful career. I, I left with a big smile on my face. And if I ever give advice to people, that's what you want to do. You never want to leave an organization when you're not, you're not happy about it. And I left with wanting more of an Air Force career. Mm. I really cherish that. But I also, as a child, I had a burning desire to be a filmmaker and an actor, a talent as well. And so I realized at 39 years old, sitting on a surfboard in Australia where I was doing some post-grad school, <laughs> I said, yeah, you know what? Life's too short. Got to go try this. And so I did. I jumped in with both feet, both arms, legs, everything <laughs> into the deep end and became a filmmaker. And at the same time, I was given some offers to fly in some civilian aerobatic teams like the Patriots jet team out of the Bay Area in California. Great bunch of ex-Blue Angels, Thunderbirds, and I was the uh, token snowbird Canadian guy. <laughs> and I've flown some F-86s and some T-33s for giggles as well. Awesome. Well, hey, what do you say we talk about the film stuff you're doing at the end? Because I think there's some things you have done, but there's also some things you're doing and hope to do, correct? That is right. Yeah, I've had some amazing experiences in the film world uh, came out of the gates with a project that went well and have a couple of really cool projects on the horizon that I'm happy to talk about. And you seem like the kind of guy we've gotten along pretty well since we've uh, met virtually some time ago. We were hoping to do this, by the way, in person, but another victim of the COVID nonsense, I guess. But No kidding. Yeah. I see this as hopefully something where we can be mutually beneficial for each other here as far as continuing professional and relationship going forward. For starters, let's talk about the Snowbirds because it's one of those teams I've always known of. I don't think I've ever seen them. And I think for the listeners, certainly folks in certain places may have seen you come through. But let's start at the beginning. Now, you are known as the 431st Air Demonstration Squadron, as I understand. And that designation has been around, at least the squadron numbering, I think since World War II. But the team has only been around since the early 70s. Is that right? That's correct. So it did start as an official RCAF squadron uh, bombers and different airplanes over the years. But in 1971, the team stood up as the Snowbirds and became an air demonstration squadron, which is an entirely different role to its past. It's actually the 50th season this year, yeah. which is a big milestone, obviously, for any squadron, let alone any team. And so, unfortunately, that season is being cut short. Again, no thanks to this pandemic nonsense, but maybe they'll still get a couple performances. All right, so what is the mission of the Snowbirds? I mean, it seems obvious, but I'm guessing there's some sort of lofty, hey, we exist to do this thing, or, uh, I mean, some specific goal or mission for the team? 
Yeah, so of course there's an official answer. And when we were on the team, it was, you know, demonstrate the skill, professionalism, and teamwork of the Canadian Air Force. You know, it's that sort of thing. Right. But in truth, it has two functions. Uh, like the U.S. teams, there's a recruiting aspect to it. Mm-hmm. It is uh, meant to highlight the Royal Canadian Air Force. And at the same time, it's also an outreach. There's a uh, public relations aspect to it that goes beyond the recruiting. So there really is a notion that, the Royal Canadian Air Force is is out with the taxpayers and showing them what the team is about, interacting with them and giving a face to the name as well. Yeah. Okay. And then south of the border, because the team flies quite a bit in the United States, and that was some of the you know the best flying we did at the beginning of the season, the end of the season when Canada doesn't have air shows. There's an ambassador role with it as well. So we do go wave the flag in the South and get to fly with you guys. Do you ever do anything overseas, uh, over to Europe or elsewhere? The team has never been overseas and we've tried. And, you know, the jet is an extraordinarily good little airplane for aerobatic flying and jet demonstration. But it's a training airplane and it doesn't have the legs. Someone told me that with the prevailing winds, the jets could get to Europe but they couldn't get home. So we'd have to take the wings off and put them on a boat or something. Let's not do that. No, it would take forever. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, as I understand it, you use the CT-114 Tudor. Yes. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, it is a training. It was designed in in Canada by Canada Air as a training airplane. And it's a side-side seating, much like the T-37 was for the USAF. Mm -hmm. Had that uh, very similar configuration. I mean, the Tudor, we called it the tweet on steroids. It was pressurized, had a little more thrust, uh, a little more capability. In all in all, it's actually an extraordinary little airplane. It's a really good little airplane. I really enjoyed it. Mm. You know, for aerobatic flying, it would be nice to have the tandem seating front back because then switching sides, it doesn't really matter. Right. So we have to be very careful when how we position the jets in the formation and who flies on what side and what seat because of that side-side configuration. That said, for training new snowbird pilots, being able to sit beside your training partner is really good. So there are some pros to having that configuration. Sure. And I want to get into some of the team mechanics, if you will. But just since you Mm. brought that up, I assume they all fly from the left seat, the demonstration pilots. The people on the left side of the formation sit in the right seat so they can sit closest to the the airplanes that are flying reference to. And then the opposite the people on the right side of the team, as you're looking top down on the team, they sit in the left seat. So my assumption proved false because that was going to be my question is the folks on the left side must have to look across the cockpit. All right. So they sit on the right side. So the controls are effectively the same on both sides. They're mirrored either side. And that's unique to the snowbird jets, the school jets, when they were used for pilot training, they weren't configured like the snowbird jets. They had the snowbirds oh. added extra controls and what have you and gear levers. And okay. That was uh, designed for the snowbirds. Now the snowbirds are the only ones flying that jet. Okay. Now, so the other seat, will it remain vacant on demonstrations or will you take other folks up? I mean, I, I would think having the wrong person there who doesn't know when not to say something could be a real distraction in the middle of a maneuver. So are they generally as a standard kept empty or not during a show 100 percent. okay it is just the pilot flying that said during practices we do take other demo team people and other pilots so i've taken a number of thunderbirds and blue angels and red arrows up with us we've had some team exchanges which is actually really fun yeah get to show uh, them our stuff and they get to show us their stuff that's really cool and it always is even in moose show we would take a student pilots if they had achieved a certain point in the course where we were more assured that they weren't going to be airsick we would take them as a motivational rides during a practice and it was usually pretty eye-watering for them to see <laughs> the snowbirds yeah. you know having just done a few missions yeah no doubt but this being a training aircraft i mean i'm guessing it's obviously maneuverable but lacking afterburner um i mean what kind of performance can you get out of this airplane It is a training jet, and it does lack for a lot of power. You know, I don't think it would be stretching to say that we use 100% of the capability of that airplane (laughs) when we're flying in the routine. In fact, the show is really designed around energy management, and that's one of the key aspects of putting the routine together is, are we physically, kinematically able to do this maneuver? And so over the now 50 years, the bag of tricks, if you will, the maneuvers that have been refined and proven, they really are 
an evolution of what's capable out of the airplane. Without the afterburner, without the extra thrust that that affords, there are limitations. But I think that's the biggest thing when we've had Thunderbird and Blue Angel pilots fly with us. They just, I can't believe what you guys are doing with these airplanes with no thrust. 2,700 pounds of thrust versus you know 32,000 pounds of thrust in an F-18. You're milking every knot of energy and every... <laughs> You pull too hard, you bleed a little energy off, and you're late for your rejoin. It's just as simple as that. So yeah. it's a challenge, and that's a big part of the selection process. Who has an in, innate ability to manage energy well? Interesting. So there's less margin for making mistakes, if you will, or correcting mistakes because there's not that excess thrust. So I presume you have a lot of maneuvers that are designed for managing energy, potential kinetic, etc. The whole program, I'm guessing, is built around the idea of giving yourself the opportunity to convert, let's say, speed up to the altitude and then altitude back into speed. It's not just something you guys throw together haphazardly, no doubt. You know, you're absolutely right. And that's exactly it. We're, we're always thinking about what's my kinetic energy package right now? Do I have extra speed that I can convert to altitude? Or as I'm waiting to rejoin a group, I'll climb up to get some potential energy. Mm -hmm. And like you've just said, just that good old fighter pilot stuff, I'm going to convert it to kinetic energy, driving downhill, unloading, getting the, you know, the lift forces off the wings and try to get an extra 10 knots on the formation so I can <laughs> scoot in there just in time to make it to show center. <laughs> <laughs> well, puts pilots at their best, I'm sure. Now, I can't remember who submitted this question, but I do remember some time ago, a question was posed to me on the podcast about a lot of teams use trainer aircraft, but the U.S. always uses their frontline aircraft. And I wonder, was there ever discussion about the Snowbirds going maybe to the F-18 or was it thought maybe it would be too close to the Blue Angels or what's the thought behind using that aircraft? There are probably a couple reasons driving that. It's fair to say in Canada, we only purchased 138 F-18s to take out a tenth of them mm -hmm. to become, you know, a demonstration team would seem excessive. And I think there's a cost associated with that. Yeah. But also the mandate of the team is such that not all the pilots are fighter pilots on the team and they common denominator amongst all the pilots that they have to have some high performance, either instructional training back in the day, F5, T33 time, some sort of high performance ejection seat experience, a thousand hours on that, on something like that. Mm. And so it didn't require all the candidates to be fighter pilots. And then to have nine airplanes and nine F-18s, obviously notwithstanding the cost, but the footprint of that. And I think also the way the team presents, it's less of a show of force, mm. which I know there is a mandate in the States to be able to do that. It's to show the awe and the power of the airplanes as well. And, and that's great. And that's what they do really well. In Canada, our routine is designed to be Sometimes I hate to say it, but an aerial ballet. Yeah. It really is finesse designed to show precision and grace mm -hmm. because we don't have the speed and the sound to match what the F 18s have in the Blue Angels, for example. I think that's just a little bit of, you know, maybe the Canadianism in that as well, that it's something different. It's just evolved over time to be that way. And so there was never a, a real push to change it. Well, and it's good too, because like you said, if it was F-18s, it wouldn't be different. It would be almost just a red and white version of what the Blue Angels are doing. And so, yeah, it's a different show. It's maybe not as loud, but it's more finesse. And we've already talked about what it's like for the pilots. So I think that's a good compliment for folks who that go to different air shows because it's just a, a different presentation and there's beauty in that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and I think what we try to do is present you know, large formations of nine airplanes and doing dynamic formation changes where the nine airplanes are morphing into a different shape as they pull up into a loop. That's one of the trademark items of the Snowbirds yeah. is that big formation. And so that, you know, we can effectively do that in front of the crowd. And by the way, because we are flying at slower speeds, it actually contains us a little closer to the crowd. Mm. And so we get to our on stage presence is probably a little closer to the crowd. But also when we do break up into different groups of a group of five and a two and a two, our dead time between maneuvers is actually quite minimized. Uh, so we're always in front of the crowd. Again, a, another intentional trademark. Yeah. Well, let's return to what you talked about already, which is the people, because obviously all this is just equipment and machines and it really comes down to the people. And so we've got the pilots, like you said, you have to have some 
high performance time and a thousand hours, et cetera. What about the rest of the team? Obviously you have a handful of mechanics, uh, you have support. What does the overall team look like? Yes, it's actually a, you know, a full squadron. And I had the privilege of being the commanding officer and the team lead, which at the time was a combined role, which uh, was a very busy role, if you can imagine being on the road for seven months of the year and managing a squadron back home. But there was near 100 people in the squadron. And so we had, I think, 22 different airplanes on the roster. And the airplanes were always in a constant cycle. There would be three or four always in a full maintenance cycle being torn down and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And so that was being done back home in the hangar. Of course, for the five or six months that we were at home during the, the workup and the training season, the whole squadron complement was there. We had two big hangars in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. That's the home of jet training for uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. And there was maintenance organizations. There was admin. It was a full squadron, effectively. So the biggest part of that being maintainers, which, you know, inevitably, as you know, as a military aviator, they're the backbone of oh, yeah. any operation. They don't fix them. You don't fly them. So <laughs> a lot of effort was put into the jets. But it was only those aircraft. You didn't have any support aircraft that would go to the show in front of you or follow behind. Uh, it was just the tutors, correct? That is correct. And yeah. unlike some other teams that have a support airplane or an airlifter that goes, we initially for gosh, almost 40 years, the team just went everywhere with 11 jets. And that's what we would do with the nine show jets and two coordinator jets. Those are announcer and coordinator, and they're effectively the spare airplanes mm -hmm. if we need them on the road. And we had these toolboxes that sat in one of the seats and it had a tire and it had you know this sort of uh, emergency pack <laughs> if you will yeah. around the road and uh -huh. the team would go from weeks and weeks on a circuit with just that and obviously if we had a, a more considerable repair they would fly in apart and we would do that but the team evolved to having an 18 wheeler travel around with okay. the team so it hit most of the show so eventually there was a support vehicle it just was a rolling version, not a flying version. So if you didn't have equipment in the other seat, I have to think of an easy way to get your crew chiefs, plane captains, I don't know what you call them, but to the next show is to put them in the seat of the airplane they launch. Was, is that something you did or? Well, it's exactly what we did. And so that was one of the, the advantages of having a two-seat airplane mm -hmm. is your crew chief flew with you everywhere. Nice. So there's great advantage to that. And the Snowbirds was probably the first time that I developed a really close relationship with a crew chief. Obviously, you're friendly with them on a, a fighter squadron, but you know there's a distance and you know between you in terms of the physical distance and your, the planning process. Mm -hmm. You only really see them when you're walking out to the jet and you get to chat a little bit with the snowbirds when you're working with them day in, day out, and you're flying with them, having conversations. You get to know them, you get to know their family life, you know, right. everything about them. You actually form a, a lifelong friendship with your crew chief. And there's an added bonus that if your crew chief's flying in the jet with you, you're pretty sure sure they're maintaining it well so that, that always helps <laughs> self-preservation it comes up quite frequently on this show so yeah, yeah that makes sense there's utility yeah. okay obviously the aircraft adapted for the show with smoke generator and uh you got folks and you got special sized bags you can put in different spots so you can carry your change of outfits and a few spare tools and everything well it's funny you say that because uh, a lot of people think the hardest part of being on the road is, you know, just hotels and the rigor of being in the air show circuit. It's actually packing the jet. There's no room. <laughs> and so you have to, the snowbirds go away for upwards of five weeks at a time. Normally it's three to four weeks and we call it a swing. So you go away for three or four weeks, sometimes five. You come home for a couple of days, you change out all your, your laundry, and then you go back into it and you disappear. Unlike some of the U.S. teams that have the speed and range, they can fly home at the end of a show. Mm. The snowbirds can't. So we go in clustering. So we might work to the west part of Canada for four weeks and then we'll kind of come back home and then we'll go out to the east or we'll go south. And so we work in these swings. So we have to take enough clothing to last that amount of time but there's no space so you effectively call these two sausage bags and they're they're little bags you know <laughs> just a couple feet wide by you know a foot round and use stuff in there which you can you're putting shoes and little cracks in the nose it's quite the art to pack the snowbird jet i can imagine so all right so is there not a opportunity for some laundry someone maybe can do for you at different shows i mean i guess we're getting into some details now but i have to think you guys are really working on some of these shows and you're not going to want to wear that same flight suit the next day 
No, no. And there's also a, a team thing. If uh, someone's becoming a little ripe, you let them know about it. But no, in truth, <laughs> this is the what's not on the poster. And we used to say all the time because that's the glamour. Everyone thinks you live this uh, you know exotic, glamorous life as this air show pilot, you know, on the snowbirds. And really what it is on a Saturday morning before you show, you're running to a coin laundromat and doing laundry. <laughs> Everyone thinks maybe you're sitting around in spas and whatnot. Not at all. You're you know, you're like, I got to get this shirt dry before the show today. It's, it's uh, show business. You know, it's, Scratch, you know is. about that. You got to do what it takes. Oh, dear yeah, me. It's not glamorous at all outside the jets. <laughs> well, you probably build a lot of hours, which is great for a logbook. But in the end, maybe it doesn't matter so much. So when you go to the shows, obviously you do the performance. And then are you on the line meeting the folks or is there any static displays? What's the actual show like for you guys? The cycle, typically, you would show up mid-morning at the show site. We would brief several hours before our actual performance. And, and most times, the Snowbirds would close a show as the headline act, sure. much like the U.S. teams and the U.S. shows. Mm-hmm. There was a build-up. We'd have uh, lunch at the site, usually. And then you'd go into your briefing cycle. Obviously, if you had a secondary duty on the squadron, if you were the ops officer of the squadron, you might be dealing with the jets and the maintenance and the training officer, and there would be a show pilot dedicated to attending the morning air show briefing with all the performers. They would bring that information back, set up the briefing. And a few hours before the our actual showtime, the team would get together in the briefing room and we'd start our briefing process. So it's uh, maybe a six hour cycle to fly the show. But as you mentioned, a big part of it is actually meeting the crowd. And so occasionally we would meet the crowd beforehand if there was a special group of make a wish kids or mm. what have you we would make a point of that but typically we would save the crowd till after our show and that has a couple purposes i think it there's a better build up for the crowd and they get to see mm. right after the show and uh, they seem more enthusiastic about it but i think also it's less distractions for the pilots yeah and you got to get in the to zone keep their head focused before the show but once we land that is the number one job as soon as those engines wind down you get out of the jets and we don't fly these shows for ourselves. We fly it for the right. the audience. And so that's a really big part of the team. And we select people on the team based on their sort of personality and eagerness to be able to do that. That PR part is an important aspect of being a snowboard pilot. You know, I'm glad you said that, Scratch, because when I was on the Top Gun staff, we used to discuss a potential candidate for coming to the staff, not so much in their ability to fly, but in their character and their affability. Mm -hmm. And so you can train almost uh, to a point, someone to fly or fight or whatever, but how do you train someone to be more outgoing, more generous, more warm, all those different interpersonal skills? And those you either have or you don't. And with some cases you can change a little bit but yeah i know i think exactly what you're talking about because you want someone who's going to best represent who's going to frankly make the audience person who's asking a question in that moment feel like that's all that person cares about that pilot right if you look them in the eye you really listen for a kid you get down on a knee uh, they just eat that stuff up and who knows you might create a future pilot someday you're absolutely right. And I actually got shivers thinking about it because that's one of the, the reasons I carried on flying in air shows is that even if you're having a bad day, and of course, you know, flying air shows, you have good days and bad days. You know, the air was bumpy, the density altitude was high, and you're working really hard. And you get that out of the jet and you walk to the crowd line and you see a dad with his daughter and his son standing there their eyes are all looking at you saying please come talk to us and you walk up to them and like you say you get down on your knee and you you say you know how'd you enjoy the show today you know i really enjoyed flying for you that made my day it was awesome yeah yeah well i love kids uh that that's what it's all about so now i've not had the experiences you've had scratch but i have been to a few air shows as like a static display and i'm always Oh, pleasantly uh, surprised by some of the questions. What are some traditional questions you and your teammates get from the yeah, audience? Yeah, it, it always surprises me that they've just <laughs> watched an air show and they've seen flying craft and they always ask, did you fly that here? We get that question and it's preposterous to me because <laughs> you would think, well, of course we flew it here. But I 
often curious, are they thinking we trucked them in or we had someone else fly them in? But it's a question that comes up a lot. And of course, the smoke tanks underneath, little kids always say, are those bombs? And, you know, of course. you know those sorts of, you know, <laughs> little boy questions you get a lot of the time. Yeah. But the number one question and the question I absolutely love because it really shows someone's engaged and it shows that you've appealed to their wonder mm. is they say, what is it like to be up there? That's my favorite question. And, mm. you know, in a, many ways, that's why I've taken my aviation career into film, because that's something I want to do in the film world, is be able to really show people what's it like to be in an airplane up there in a different medium. So th that was a question that I received a lot that I, I love being able to answer. Well, and it's such an interesting question, and it's somewhat loaded, because a moment ago, I didn't challenge you on it, but now I will. You said there are good days and bad days. And mm. from the outset, right, the young boy or girl that is waiting to see you isn't thinking about the little out of position maneuver or the little bit of late or anything else. They don't see all that, but we do, right? So we have this yeah. higher demand on ourselves. And of course, when you say a bad day, I, I immediately thought of a really bad day, which thankfully are pretty rare. And I'd like to ask you about here in a little bit. But the point simply being is that most people don't see what we see. We are our own biggest critics. And so we want every show to be perfect. I was never a performance pilot, but as I understand it, there's no such thing as the perfect performance, but there's always that pursuit of it. And that's what keeps you going, right? Yeah, that's really true. And I think that's also one of the attributes we look for in a pilot. And a lot of military pilots have that, or they wouldn't have made it through the military pilot training program anyways. But really that quest for excellence is we're always mm. looking for that perfect show. And I've had a couple that, gosh, they felt, you know, close, but to your point, never perfect. Right. And I think if you actually were ever to say I had a perfect show, you probably had missed something. And perhaps that's hubris and, <laughs> and ego saying it, not reality. And so that was, I think, what made the team sharp is that yeah. pursuit of excellence all the time. And there's a personal level doing that. There's a, in a team environment, because I've been a solo F-18 pilot as well, air show pilot, uh, where you're just measuring your performance to yourself and how you did that day. But in the Snowbirds, you may have a really good day. Another guy on the team may have a bad day. Or the next day, everyone had a really good day, and you're the only one that had a bad day, and you feel like you've let the team down. So there's a team dynamic where you're all trying to work mm. not only for yourselves to have a good day, but you're trying to be good for the team as well. I uh, liken it to being perhaps on a sports team where you don't want to let the team down. You have your individual goals, but you have your goals that serve the team as well. So that, you know, it's a challenge to manage that yeah. because you really do want to have a perfect show. But, you know, the, I've been flying air shows now for 20 years. I haven't had one. <laughs> <laughs> as the listeners know, Scratch, I sometimes use American football as analogies on this show. And, and I think about the poor guy who decided at some point in his life to be the kicker, <laughs> uh, right? The field goal kicker. Because inevitably what happens, the team grinds it out for 45 minutes, or I don't remember how long games are, I guess 60 minutes, right? So for 59 minutes, they grind it out and they're down by two. And they put all of it on this one kicker. And he might win it or he might lose it. But if he loses it, it's so easy to blame him. But no, it was the whole team the whole time. Right. Had we scored 10 extra points, it wouldn't have mattered. And so I love what you're saying there. And I'll tell you, I don't know about you. Of course, you have some different experiences since leaving, but I've only been out of the military a couple of years. And I think more than anything is what I miss on the outside is finding a purpose or a group of people where you can still experience and enjoy that because there's nothing else like it, whether it's sports or in our case, military aviation. It's so true. And, and that's one of my quests in the film world is to find that same sense of mission that I have because I've, you know, the film world is so amazing. I really enjoy being a filmmaker, but to have that same team spirit and camaraderie, it's not as obvious to have that. And I think we were very privileged and fortunate to have the environments as, you know, as fighter pods to be able to immerse in squadrons and, and get that right away. And so as I've evolved in my own film career, I'm starting to find like minds and recognizing, you know, those patterns. And I think I'll get there, but it's not as immediate as you would find in the, our Air Force and, and Navy days. 
Well, good stuff. So I want to ask you about some of the extra flying activities you guys do, but first let's talk about the demonstration. So mm-hmm. you talked about nine aircraft. What's the general flow of the show? Like, for example, I'm just used to the Blue Angels. So they'll start off as the diamond takes off and then the two solos, and you've got kind of the alternating events. And then at the end, there's this almost celebratory feel when they all six join up. So what is the snowbird demonstration like? And again, I've never seen it. Well, we'll have to change that. Maybe I'll have to go fly with them. Oh. Yeah. I know people. Well, that'd be a first because I haven't flown with any of the U.S. teams, darn it. (laughs) I think you'd find it amazing, Ashley. Oh, I'm sure. I'd probably get sick, though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would be wondering about myself now. Well, I've been flying air shows lately, so but it's never the same when you're not in control, right? Mm -hmm. But the show does represent that sort of beginning, middle, and end. So the team starts together. You know, the classic line, the nine twinkling lights coming towards the crowd and pulls up (laughs) and we call it the, you know, the opener sequence. There's uh, the nine jets fly around together for six, seven minutes, changing patterns and changing formations in front of the crowd. And then there's the split up into what's called the integrated section. And that goes for a healthy amount of time, you know, upwards of almost 20 minutes in some cases. And that's where the team will break up into groups of five and two and three and perform different maneuvers. And then, just as you've said, the team comes together for the closer and all nine jets get together again. And there's a few more patterns flown with usually some sort of spectacular bomb burst at the end of it all. Awesome. How long does the show typically last? It's varied from almost 40 minutes down to low 30s over the years. And and that's a function of the team lead because the team and the team lead have some say in how the show is put together and choreographed every year. Scratch. So there's some years that's been longer, some years shorter. I always like to have it on the low side of 30 minutes. Mm. I like to leave people wanting a little bit more. That was my approach to it. <laughs> like a good meal. Uh, there you go. Sounds good. So I didn't know, like I said, never been a demo pilot, even solo. I didn't know about some of the, like, different contingencies or escape maneuvers, I guess you would call them, until we had uh, little Guido on the show. He was a former Blue Angel CEO, possibly you know him. Mm -hmm. But he talked about as they look at transitioning to the Super Hornet, that they have to have almost at any given point, and and this is where I'd like you to tell me if I'm right or not, but they have sort of an out. So no matter what they're doing, if all of a sudden they lose an engine, which I didn't even think to ask you, is the Tudor a one or two engine airplane? It's a one engine, single engine airplane, yes. Oh, wow. Well, if you lose your one and only then, especially, but in the F-18, of course, any kind of aircraft malfunction, you have something that you, as I understand it, know what to do in that moment. Is that basically true? Yes, it is. And uh, we call them our escape maneuvers, our outs. We design a maneuver Mm -hmm. around what are the outs. In fact, if we get to a point in maneuver where we come up to a wall where there are no outs for something, we'll actually risk manage that maneuver. And and in some cases, we may not even pursue that maneuver because, you know, in that one in a million chance, and we know how Murphy works, there's a potential we can't get somebody out of the formation if they had a bird strike or a loss of an, an engine then we might not fly it. So there always is an escape maneuver, escape pattern. And having been the lead of the snowbirds, you know, we always talk about number four, number three, and and we go out and sometimes we rehearse them. We certainly talk through it all. Mm -hmm. And we talk it through to a logical completion of, let's say two hit a bird today, lost an engine, what would you do? Well, you know, we never really talk about what if lead loses engine. And sure enough, when I was leading the team in a practice mission, training mission, south of Moose Jaw in the spring, migration bird migration season we went through a flock of ducks and i tagged six mallards apparently oh and we heard that horrible sound of boo as my engine <laughs> well first i heard what sounded like cannonballs yeah uh, hitting the airplane and then instantly lost my engine i pulled out one's off engine just as we brief All of a sudden, there were eight wingmen looking for their lead. We had a contingency for that, and the team executed that well. But, you know, so it does happen. And we exercise exactly, you know, a one's out situation because some of pulling out a formation destabilizes it. There's a ripple that goes through the whole formation. And we do fly as close as four feet to one another. So it can be tricky. That said, we have also a philosophy that if you can stay with a formation, stay with the formation. If you have to leave the formation, you leave the formation because sometimes leaving the formation is Mm -hmm. causes more risk than staying with it. Let's say you hit a sparrow and you just felt the little thump. 
then it's probably safer to stay with the formation rather than pull out in a dynamic rolling maneuver at that point. So there's sort of a, a lot of rehearsed and ground rehearsed and chair flowing and contingencies. Because there's all these second order effects, right? In that example, when you pulled out, suddenly the flight was without a leader. And I assume number two immediately became the lead and everyone flies off him. Yes, that's exactly it. One of the inner pilots then becomes the de facto lead and the team flies off that person. And they, they obviously stabilize what the maneuver was and spread it out and take stock of what's happened. I think that's possibly something folks who don't do this job don't fully understand is it's not just the performance, which itself you have to practice and know rote memory. It's not like you're looking at a card. Oh, what maneuvers next? Right. You know, everything you have to do, but then you also know all these contingency things you have to do, whether something happens at this point or at that point, or if the weather suddenly changes or the wind shifts or something. I just think it's amazing to me. And again, I've on the show multiple times talked about, what I feel are the commonalities of the, being a military pilot to almost any other traditional profession, doctor, lawyer, whatever, is that it requires so much of the people who do what we do, not just mentally, but physically. I think that's one of the things I enjoyed about being a military pilot is that there was always that desire for excellence and professionalism. Mm. And it's not that I've seen the opposite of that in the civilian world, because I've worked with some amazing civilian pilots in many aspects of flying. It's just that that was the prerogative of being a military pilot is pursuit of excellence and being professional and showing up prepared. And I responded to that early on and it helped me. I think why I, I wouldn't say I'm successful necessarily as a filmmaker in the big scheme of things, but I think those traits and those characteristics that were reinforced in the military have helped me in my new career cool. and have given me great perspective and tools to use and approach. And interestingly, I just briefed a, a large production company online yesterday, sort of for a training day. They were doing a lunch and learn because they're all working remotely and they're looking for things just to appeal. And I discussed, you know, a NATO air operation where effectively it's centralized command, decentralized execution, which a lot of production companies are using right now because they have to with uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about, you know, the way of communicating and how people have SOPs and how the professionalism is what really makes things to come together. I can see that a lot of that, those skills that we know or we've learned and characteristics are translatable to other careers. And that's been something I've been enjoying in this new career. No doubt. Well, let's talk about your experiences on the team because you've said now that you were twice a snowbird. So tell us about the first time. What was it like to be accepted on the team and what was your number or position? Right. And so I had just been the CF-18 demo pilot. Okay. And then I got the air show bug. I actually found that there was a performer in me that came alive and sort of <laughs> reemerged from my childhood when I, you know, I did a little bit of performing type stuff, but didn't really. I was more driven to be a, a pilot. And so I found I really enjoyed that. And then the snowbirds came around and there was an opportunity to apply for the team. And I jumped right on that. And I was successful through the trials, which were very challenging, to be honest, because unlike anything else you and I've done, I assume that you're competing against a standard for a course in the snowbirds, you're competing against other people. You could have, in my case, there were, I think, six of us in the final selection for three spots. All six were, you know, talented pilots, you'd like to think. Right. And so three people are going to walk away without having that, where they probably had the skills to do it, but, you know, the way things worked out. So you're not competing against standards. So it was a very interesting experience. And then I was selected as the number seven pilot, the outer left wing pilot, which is, you know, you're responsible for managing the big formations and you fly in some unique places in the formation. And probably one of the more challenging positions for energy management because you're so far out in the moment arm. For example, there's one, we call it the five plane line abreast roll. So you take five airplanes, line abreast, and we roll it. Not many teams in the world do that, let alone in underpowered airplanes. And so the initial moment as the left outer left wing, it would roll into me I would have to go idle speed brakes so I didn't shoot ahead of the formation. And then within about a half second, upside down, I have to time it to go full power boards in, or I would stretch <laughs> away and disappear. 
And so the energy management required of that was the real challenge and became my little markers of success for each show. Like, could I nail it? And, and <laughs> that's the one maneuver. Yeah, huh? that was the wow. haymaker. We were like, ah, yeah. And so for three years, I did three years on the team as the number seven pilot. I moved up as the training officer and, and more leadership positions in the team there. At the end of that tour, I told the CEO at the time, I said, you know, I really want to come back as the team lead. I, I love this. I knew I needed to, to walk away from her for a few years because I was recently married and we were thinking about kids sure. and being on the road six, seven months of the year is not great for family life. And you'd burn out a little bit. You're on you know, high energy state for a long time. In my case, it was four years with the demo and the Hornet demo. I managed to come back uh, a number of years later as the team lead, which was the pinnacle of my career. Oh, I can imagine. All right. So before we move on to that though, so you changed, uh, let's call it billets or jobs, collateral duties on the snowbirds, but you maintain the same position. So you never changed in those couple of years from the number seven position. No, in my case, uh, there wasn't a need to at times, People have moved around the formation. I wouldn't say that's uncommon, but by and large, when you make the team, you stay in that position. And one would think doing three years, because normally there were two years and the teams evolved in the last 15, 20 years to a three-year tour. Mm -hmm. And that's to address not only pilot shortages, but it also gave some consistency for cycling people through. And there were some advantages to that. But by the end of my you know, first year, I'd pretty much figured out the number seven position. In my second year, I was able to really focus in on little micro details about, you know, my little goals right. to really try to do it well. In the third year, I can honestly say it was a challenge to keep myself stimulated. And I had to check myself a few times hmm. to not think about other things. And I remember being at the top of a loop and it was halfway through the season. And I said to myself in my head, I went, lasagna. I feel like eating lasagna tonight. <laughs> and I immediately went, what the uh, heck are you doing? Get your head in the game. I'm so glad you said yeah. that, Scratch, because I remember reading about a Thunderbird pilot doing that very same thing. At the top of a loop, he said, oh, yeah, I have to go by the commissary on the way home. Yeah, it, interesting. Eh? <laughs> yeah, but I think that's a mark also of what the human body is capable, not to take anything away from you, but the fact that I'm guessing, I don't know if you can remember your first flight, but a lot like brand new drivers, you think about everything you're doing in the car. And by the time you're 20 something, you're flipping the radio channel and God forbid texting or doing other things that you shouldn't be doing. But the point is later on, you get so proficient at it that you can afford to think about lasagna. And it really was a a check step for me that perhaps I was getting a little complacent at that time because, Mm. like you say, the proficiency level is so high. And probably I was perfectly safe doing it, but had something gone wrong there, I wasn't 100% in the game and I might not have been able to react in the appropriate way. So I took that as a good lesson to myself that, okay, you might be thinking you're doing really well and being able to, you know, fly this without breaking too much of a sweat now, but you're probably fooling yourself. And so that was a bit of a lesson to me, but it was interesting. Like you say, the very first few shows on my first year, you know, I bet I sweat five, six pounds out and you know, <laughs> I squeezed the death grip on the stick and my heart was racing the whole time. Right. By the end of it, you know, I can't even imagine being at a point that I would say lasagna. Because now to even go back in having flown, you know, a number of different jet teams and whatnot, you know, the thought of jumping into that seven position right now actually terrifies me again, because I would be like, man, I don't know if I could do it anymore. But like you say, it is funny what the human body can do and will do sometimes. All right. So you left thinking, okay, this is a good time to take a break, but you knew you wanted more. And so coming back, I have to assume there was once again, some sort of arduous screening process because now you're not just on the team, you are leading the team. So what was it like being selected as the commander? Right. In the commander case and the lead, it wasn't a flying competition because they knew your flying skills based on your experience with the team. And I'd risen, you know, I like to think I did well as a wingman on the team both physically and in my other duties as an officer and what have you. you know, I'd been an operations officer on a fighter squadron in between. Okay. And so I've been exposed to some leadership and management of resources and people. It really was an interviewing process. Again, a short list down to three people. And it was just getting some insight into the mind, you know, where you were at that point in your career and your life, you know, some 
philosophical questions about leadership and approaches to things and presenting a few scenarios. If this went on with this you know, person on your team, what would you do? And just getting a sense mm-hmm. beyond what they knew of you already. So one of the advantages of having a small air force in Canada is we pretty much know everyone. Uh, and so the, I wasn't an unknown commodity at that point. But the interviewing process does allow people to drill down under duress a little bit to see how people respond and think around certain circumstances. Yeah. I was successful through that and you know, I was uh, on my way to leading the team. So I have to think that being the leader of a team or really anything for that matter is different than being one of the team members because you can almost blend in when you're number seven. You've got other peers, you've got this oh shared burden of we are all in this together. But when you're the guy everyone's looking to, I have to think it's different. It is. And it was an interesting, it was probably the pinnacle, it was the pinnacle of my career for sure, most rewarding, but it was also one of the most challenging positions I've ever had in my career. Mm. And then on one hand, you are a team member as one of the, you know, the nine show pilots in, you know, up in the sky for sure. And you are one entity up there and, and you need to be a team member in the sky and then on the ground socially you'd need to be one of the guys in my case and my first time around actually we we had uh, marie's the first canadian female snowbird pilot so in my case as lead it was an old guy team you had to be one of the guys but then you also had to be the leader and you're also the front man for the team so that extra pressure was put on you as the lead for sure yeah whenever you went to a social engagement of which we went to probably four events per week where you're on parade effectively for the organizers the sponsors uh-huh. you go into hospitals and whatnot you're the front person so you're speaking every day you're the one that everyone looks to in the organization you can't hide in the shadows at all where right. you're on point all the time and that was very fatiguing i found uh, over time even though i like that i'm a social guy you're always under scrutiny and everyone's always watching what the lead's doing And then at times you have to be a leader with the teams and there's times where you're not one of the guys and you have to be the boss and you have to set the vector, right? There was an interesting play there and different personalities on the team uh, react different ways um, because you're so close. You know them in some cases more than you know your own siblings, Mm -hmm. their quirks, their eating habits. You could sit down with a group of five guys at a table for dinner, look at the menu and go, Three's going to order this. I'm going to, you just know exactly what they're going to do because the human patterns, you've seen it so many times. And you get very familiar at an interpersonal level, being a team member, even as the lead. But then every once in a while, you know, the edge, the lines get blurred and pushed a little bit. And you have to bring it back and say, okay, guys, this is the way we're going to do things now. It's no longer a debate. Yeah. And uh, you have to be the boss at times. I wasn't an autocratic kind of leader, but once in a while you had to, like, here's the marching orders. Here's how we have to go. Well, but you also have to be the stabilizing, steady force when the winds blow certain ways, if you will. A metaphor for bad things can happen in this business. And as I understand, during your tenure as lead, you lost a wingman? I did. And I, I'm quite comfortable speaking about it. It was one of the most formative things in my life. I've been on squadron. I've been on bases where we've lost fighter pilots good friends, and it affects you in obviously in a big way. There was something about being the leader of the team and losing one of your wingmen on your watch. I bear that burden, I'll admit, right to today. It's um, even though I'm probably not at fault, well, I'm not at fault uh, you know, in a technical sense, but you never fully give that away. You still bear some burden about that. It was very challenging, and it also, there was a very interesting moment. I'd been in leadership positions prior to that, but the penny dropped for me when I was the uh, lead when we lost Sean, my number two, at the very first air show down in Great Falls. Mm. Like the honeymoon for me was over. I was so excited to be in the lead. We had a great workup training season. There was a a malfunction in the seatbelt when he rolled upside down beside me and literally fell from the seat and lost control of the airplane and lost his life as a result of that, you know, horrific and terrible accident. We saw him go in, you know, very visually traumatizing. But then you're like, no, you're the lead of the team, you know, in that same instant, you're like, all right, now I have eight of us up here. I need to sort this out. 
And we were separated into our different groups at that time in the integrated portion and started having to, you know, do the, what we're trained to do is, uh, as leaders and fighter pilots is you start directing and say, okay, you two go there, go land, do this, do that. Mm-hmm. And I was one of the last people to land, making sure everyone got down safely. And there was this moment that was the sort of the penny drop moment for leadership for me. When we landed, the routine always, whether we did a show or a practice or a transit, was we'd all meet in the middle of the line of jets at the number five jet. And I said to everyone as we were landing, I said, okay, let's just get all the ground crew, all of you, let's all meet at the five jet for an overwing, is what we called it. I landed, and of course, the wing commander, the airshow organizers, they all met me at the jet, and they all wanted to talk. And I said, sir, ladies and gentlemen, I need to go speak to my team because that's the priority right there. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking those however many steps, 100 yards to the five jet. And that moment of all those eyes staring at me, and they all said the same thing. They said, what do we do now, boss? And Mm -hmm. I saw it in all their eyes, that question. And I went, ah, that's what you know, the leadership positions about. It's not when things are going well, it's when things are going wrong. Yeah. How do you respond to that? And so that was a very interesting and palpable moment for me that, okay, this is what my training has been and the trust they put me in to being the leader and this is what I have to do. And you had to be really strong for the whole team. It was a really informative, life informative moment for me as a human, as a leader. I don't doubt that. I can't imagine what it was like. I mean, this is a guy you're spending almost more time with than your spouse, especially once you get on the road. And suddenly, just like that, they're gone. And it's so hard. It is. And, you know, we were just talking just before the flight. We were both sailors and we were talking about sailing. He had a big smile as, you know, I could see he loved sailing as well. And and I had had some success sailing or racing sailboats in my life. You know, we got into those jets and, you know, I was expecting to talk more about sailing with them. And it's all done. It's all over. Yeah. So when that happens, a team, again, as we'll come back to Hollywood here in a little bit, as they say, the show must go on. And, and certainly I know the appropriate memorable, uh, what am I trying to say, you know, ceremonies and different ways to memorialize your lost uh, wingman took place. But as the show goes on, is there some sort of contingency or some system where when you leave the team, you kind of know that at any moment the phone could ring and you would have to come back and join the team? Because in that case, you can't just make a number two overnight, right? So did last year's number two come back to the team at that point? That's exactly what happened. And we had called upon uh, Coolio, is his name, to come back. And you know, credit to him, he had just moved on to, you know, an exciting new posting, his family uh, were all established in another base, another part of the country, you know, say, hey, would you come back? You know, this is going to really be the only way the team can go forward without a number two as a team. You know, he answered the call right away. There was, I think, no hesitation on his part. I think it required a bigger discussion, you know, a life discussion with family and everything else. And, and having the reality sink in that, oh, by the way, high performance flying low level to the ground in aerobatics is actually a riskier proposition in an airplane than in most cases. So it's very confronting to, you know, his wife who perhaps breathed a sigh of relief when he left the team. Mm -hmm. Now he has to come back and, oh, by the way, there was just a crash. So I think it's very tough. I certainly never underestimated the sacrifice of the family in that case as well. I have to think when you sign on at the beginning, you know that that is a potential contingency later is, hey, I could do my successful tour here and then move on. But, oh, by the way, it's not to say that the team comes before everything else, but to a degree it kind of does. In other words, hey, we've got a show that's got to go on. You have a special skill that we need. And by the way, you belong to the government, so we're going to use you. But I would hope that in his case, they trained someone up as fast as they could and then let him get back to his posting and didn't interfere with his career. In other words, it wasn't like he wasn't eligible for a promotion or something else no. because he was used on the team, right? If anything, the senior ma- leadership, they recognize he had made a sacrifice and right. and facilitated his career a little bit to help him that way because they recognize that. Yeah. And you're right. There is an unwritten obligation because it is an extreme privilege to be part of the Snowbirds. As they say, there's more chance of being an NHL hockey player 
in Canada than being a snowbird by perhaps orders of magnitude because two or three are selected a year. And, wow. you know, that honor bestowed to you is, you know, there is a call at times. I know the, the alumni, we nurture the team. Like I have a project coming up. I'm planning to make an IMAX movie about the Snowbirds jet team oh. and uh, moved quite a ways along with that. Obviously a little bit of a pause here with the pandemic, but you know, I'm doing that because the Snowbirds are in my blood now. This is mm. part of my life. It's not just a casual visit to the team. You once a Snowbird, always a Snowbird, that sort of thing. And you look out for the best interests of the team. I can only imagine. I am jealous. I think that's awesome to belong to something that can continue for the reasons we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. All right. We talked about rushing off to laundry in the mornings and showing up uh, before show day. But when you go to an air show weekend, let's say, what are you doing besides the performance? I have to think there are some extra flying activities that the Snowbirds... Well, we do a lot of flyovers. And so as we go to a new city, we arrive and typically like they like us to advertise it. So we fly over the city. Okay. And if there's some special event that's going on, we'll actually make an effort to time our arrival to that. If there's a, a bridge opening or some new organizations having some big event, we like to do that. That's part of us giving back to you know the, our taxpayers, our community. We do that sort of contingency flying in between some of the flying. First, perhaps I'll explain our routine. The Snowbirds, we actually fly shows midweek as well. And so we'll typically arrive somewhere on a Thursday morning. We'll do media and a social event. We'll do a Friday morning event, perhaps, and then a practice and then media, a social event. We'll do Saturday, Sunday shows. Typically, we get Monday off. So our Sunday nights are our Friday nights. Okay. We'll have Monday off, and then Tuesday we'll fly to a location, a small town typically, to fly a, and we'll do a Tuesday night social event, and then we'll fly a Wednesday afternoon or evening show, and then we start that process over and over again. Wow. So there's actually six days of the week we're flying, so the proficiency is really high. Yeah. Occasionally, if we have a little stretch of a few days off, we might throw our training mission in there where we say, hey, we've been struggling with this one maneuver. Let's say the the five plane line abreast roll, that tricky one that I spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. And we might go up and do a dedicated 45 minute an hour practice, just working on that maneuver, seeing if we can, you know, did we get a little mission creep on it or are we just something missing on it? And so we'll do that. But sort of the pace of the flying is such that your proficiency level is pretty peak throughout that six month yeah, season. I would think. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're practicing, you've got folks on the ground that are either recording or giving you feedback and it's a full team effort. It is. And so we have a videographer and we do a video debrief after every practice and show. And we sit down and it's quite rigorous. We have a training officer who's writing notes on everyone. And a big part of it is it's not so much stop the tape. What were you doing there? <laughs> the philosophy is you should be able to identify your error before it shows up on the tape. So you'll say, okay, on the line of breast roll, I stretched three or four feet on the backside, mismanaged my energy. That'll be one of my goals for tomorrow. And then we look at it on the tape and we say, okay, well, maybe it's this, or perhaps leads comes in. He says, well, I might've quickened my roll up there and that might've stretched you a little bit as well to figure it out. So there's a bit of a debate, but the goal is to always come down with an 80% solution of, of self-awareness of what you did right and wrong in that mission. Yeah. And then we confirm it. Well, and as you said earlier, so important to do it for yourself, not necessarily someone else, although certainly if they don't, but the idea being is that you should be the one pointing out the things you did, not someone else pointing out what you did. Absolutely. And I'm sure that was the same way in fighter pilot training. I, I was a fighter pilot instructor as well. And I'm sure in Top Gun, that was a, a trait you were looking for in, in, in the folks going <laughs> through there as well. Yeah, that's fairly universal. Well, Scratch, this has been really cool. I'd like to transition towards the end of the show. And again, as we said earlier, we have some listener questions. These are from our Patreon supporters. These are generous folks who help out with the show, but in doing so financially, they also get some perks. And one of those is they get to ask questions to certain guests. Oh, nice. So I'd like to pose some of these to you and then we'll wrap it up, find out what the future has for you. We'll get a read on your call sign and, <laughs> and we'll hop out of here. Perfect. How's that sound? So let's see. Alex Gillis says, is it true that the airplane is constantly trimmed slightly out of center so that the stick always has tension on it? So Axel Foley, Steve Foley was the CEO of the Blue Angels for a while. He's a friend of mine, former 
Top Gun instructor. And he used to talk about, I think they had something they actually attached to give them so much pressure and they would have to ice their arms because it would get so tenuous for them. Uh, did you guys do something similar in the Snowbirds? We just didn't ice. That's the difference. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, you guys live up in the yeah. ice, so you're, you're used to being tougher yeah, than yeah. we are. All right, very no, good. Touché. But absolutely. We would load up the forward stick pressure upwards of 20, 25 pounds. And depending on the position you flew, you would use more or less forward trim pressure. Oh. And it's even uh, more important in a training airplane with a low wing loading wing because it reacts to the bumps more. So we needed more trim force to dampen out the bumps. And that was the main reason. And it's in that kind of formation flying, it's easier to regulate degrees of releasing the stick than pushing and pulling it to stay in formation right and so that was the main reason we did it for just consistency and having a, a more stable platform and being able to ride through the bumps as it became bumpier we would load up more trim pressure on the outer wings we used a lot of trim pressure because in the big moment arms as the formation rolled into you you never wanted to be pushing on the stick. So you would load up a lot of trim pressure, anticipating that roll coming on. And then you would allow the jet and the stick to just dump forward. You would just release the pressure rather than having to push the stick forward. So that's one of the reasons. But I still, to this day, and I haven't been on the Snowbirds in 10 years, I still have a larger right forearm than a left forearm. <laughs> it's silly. <laughs> I have one crazy bump muscle there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right. There you go. That's exactly what I was expecting. All right. Matthew Willemanson says, what's the future aircraft for the Snowbirds? How long can they continue with the Tudors? And then as a bonus, with an unlimited budget, what would you select for the next aircraft, Scratch? Good question. It's a little bit unknown. I know that they're going to be able to fly the Tudor out for another decade. It's actually an okay. amazing little airplane. They've been able to retrofit some components of it. They're upgrading some avionics on it. And that's real limitation now is avionics. The airframe is still quite sound. In the 60s, they over-designed these airplanes. They're quite robust, excellent little airplanes. And so that airplane is going to continue for the foreseeable future. What I would anticipate is going to be what we're training in. It, so it'll either be something like the Hawk that they've been flying or a turboprop like the, the PC-9 variant that the Royal Canadian Air Force is flying right now, a team, something like that. Being a jet guy, I really want the airplane to be a jet. Mm -hmm. So I would love it to be something like the Hawk that uh, the British Red Arrows, they fly the Hawk and do a great job with it. That would be a great airplane. Having said that, the type of the show and the spectrum of pilots that the team draws from and uses, the perfect solution, and I've told this to the defense minister when I was uh, the lead, he sat in the jet with me, he said, what do you think the best airplane is? I said, if we could get the molds out for the Tudor out of Canada Air and remake the Tudor, put a glass cockpit in, a modern engine and wet wings, I said, it still would be the best airplane for that role. I've flown hmm. in other jet teams. I've flown in many different types of jets in formation, including, you know, the L-39s. And for the role and the type of show that the Snowbirds do, I don't think there is a better airplane for it. Excellent. So you would think it would be something hyper tech, you know, new and technologically advanced, but really that airframe platform is, is an amazing platform. All right. Uh, the next question is from Jevo, who says, I read that Canadian Forces, Transport Canada, and in the U.S., the Federal Aviation Administration need to approve your maneuvers. Have they ever disapproved of a maneuver? In my experience, I've never heard of something being denied. Okay. That said, both the Transport Canada and the FAA uh, need to approve the show. Over the years, when different rule sets have come in or different focuses, for example, in the late 80s, when that horrific uh, Ramstein accident occurred, mm. there was pressure for people to take energy directed towards the crowd maneuvers out of routines. And so at that time, there was not scrutiny, but uh, there was due diligence applied to military jet teams. Where are we directing energy towards the crowd in our maneuvers? And so over the years, there's been clarification on things. But to my knowledge, there's never been an outright denial of a maneuver. And I think that's in part because let's say there are 70 potential sequences that the snowbirds could fly and 45 of them are flown in any given year. Those have been proven and the risk managed and all of that. So I think there's typically no surprises year to year. It's just how you choreograph all those different maneuvers together. 
Gotcha. Andrew asks, what's the cost difference between flying five Hornets? I wonder if he means six, but, you know, a demonstration team of Hornets versus nine Tudors. Scratch, I'm going to take a guess at this one. I'm going to still say the Tudors cheaper, even though there's more of them. It's way cheaper. You know, <laughs> as I mentioned, I was the F-18 solo demonstration pilot. Mm -hmm. And you may remember from your time in full afterburner at sea level, you can burn 1,000 pounds a minute in an F-18 in the airshow routine. <laughs> That would mm -hmm. run the whole show in the snowbirds pretty much, just in fuel alone, <laughs> just that fuel burn rate. And so just the, the wow. scales are so different that you could fly 30 tutors, I think, for the cost of six F-18s and not even, wow. you know, the capital cost aside, I think just pure fuel consumption and what have you. The tutor is, you know, it's been long paid for and it's a relatively efficient little jet. Excellent. All right, so I think we may have answered Joe Kunzler's question. He says, how does the Tudor fly, and how is it like flying old gauges versus the modern digital stuff? Now, again, yeah, I'm guessing, not having done this, you're not looking inside too much as a snowbird, or are you? Not really at all. And, and actually, going back to one of your questions, what's one of the most common questions is, do you use computers to fly, or they tell you how close you are? Right. Not at all. It's all eye and hands. Hands and feet and eyes, I guess that's a better way to say it. Yeah. And... It's inconsequential what the dashboard says, because once we have a good engine and we, we have an airspeed gauge, that's all you're really looking at throughout the show. And you're obviously cross-checking some of your engine instruments sure. routinely through when you get a break from the formation. But it's all looking outside, which is, you know, the most purest form of flying, which is wonderful. That said, because the Tudor has an older display panel, flying instrument conditions is more challenging in a modern airspace environment with a lot of GPS and RNAV type approaches. Mm -hmm. Even though they've integrated some more modern technology, it's still sort of a hybrid of the two, and it's not a glass cockpit by any means. All right. Jacob Meltzer asks, the sheer size of the Snowbird formation has always impressed me. How quickly is a newly formed Snowbirds team able to build up to the full nine aircraft formation when we're preparing for a season? And if I can take a stab at this scratch, it almost sounds like Jacob is asking, hey, let's take nine folks and put them together and make a team. That would probably take a long time. But in reality, over the course of any one year, you're only turning over what, maybe a third of it? So two or three pilots? That is correct. You're absolutely right. And to your first point, if you just took nine people off the street, I think it would take a year plus to safely develop that team and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we do just switch out a third of the team every year, there's a baseline of knowledge and skill sets already there that can guide the newcomers on. But basically, the new pilot selectees will show up at the end of the season in October. They'll start training, and sometimes the first shows are early May. So there's really not a lot of time to get them spun up. And in that time, they'll have flown a couple hundred training missions. The goal always was, can you loop the nine plane before Christmas? That's the goal. And that's, you know, <laughs> the building block of all the maneuvers is yeah. being able to nine plane diamond as being able to do that. And that doesn't mean the show is anywhere near put together, but that was always one of the goals. Right. Can you safely solo loop the whole nine airplanes? And then you start building all the components. There is a training season that uh, moves to Comox, British Columbia on the West Coast. And it's a dedicated two or three weeks where you just fly twice, three times a day, every single day, six days a week, nice. and getting up and there's no distractions of home and anything else. It's about refining the show. So you go there with the show 95% complete and you go there and you top it up and refine it. Spring training for a baseball team. Okay. Gundog asks, if you could do a full tour as a demo pilot with any other team in the world other than the Snowbirds, who would it be? Why? In what position? And again, you've already flown the L-39 with the Patriots, but what if you could go to any other team? Who would it be there, Scratch? I have to admit it would be the uh, Royal Air Force Red Arrows. Of course, I've flown Hornets before, and I really I love the Blue Angel show. I'd say in the States, that's my preferred show down there. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that uh, with all my buddies. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, having flown the Hornet, been there, done that, and I think. But what I love about you know, the U.S. shows is when you do want to see power and speed, you get to go see that in the Thunderbirds and the and the Blue Angels. Mm -hmm. And when you want to see big formations and grace and dynamic maneuvering, you get to see that with the Snowbirds. Well, I think the Red Arrows do a little bit of both. 
they present nine jets like the snowbirds the jet's a little more capable and it makes a little more noise and it goes a little bit faster <laughs> and so it's a nice merge or blending of the two types of performances and so that's the one and i've flown with the red arrows in as a passenger a few times now hmm. and i've got to see what they do and it's pretty amazing what they do because what they do with those airplanes, they're maxing them out 100% capacity of what those airplanes can do as well. So I like that challenge of that. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that the jet, you know, it's a good looking jet as well. And it, it goes pretty fast. So that would be my answer. Okay. Now they came to the States, I guess it was last year, and we tried very hard to overlap our schedules to do a show with them. And it just never worked out, unfortunately. Mm. Great. All right. The last question then is from Terry Alberta, who says, what do you do when a tutor needs a specific part or repair or replacement, is there a boneyard of Tudor parts? Now, we just had a show recently, as you and I are recording this, on our boneyard down in Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona. But what do you guys do for your the things you need? You know, going back almost 20 years, uh, when they retired the Tudor from the school, the training unit, they knew the Snowbirds were going to keep that airplane for a number of years. And so they harvested all the, the parts they could in the system and put them all in the Snowbirds uh, operation early on, thinking, okay, we need to go out at least a couple decades with this. But there were over 100 tutors on the line in the training depot. And so they've moved them all to a place in Ontario called Trenton. They've identified a number of them that they could basically mothball and pull out of retirement if they needed them. Hmm. And so there's a couple layers. There's a, a stockpile in Moose Jaw, and of the 11 show jets there are, as i said there are probably another 10 in mushra as well in varying levels of maintenance but there are probably another 20 sort of wrapped up to harvest or to uh, cannibalize if required as well <laughs> all gruesome expressions but it makes the point yes <laughs> all right well thanks you're a good sport on answering those and uh, we always get such great questions from our listeners so we do appreciate that all right, Scratch. Well, man, people ask for longer episodes and they're getting it today. If my clock is right here, we're about an hour and 20 plus. Mm -hmm. And this has been really fascinating. And for me, I just love to learn new things. And you always feel like you know certain things because you're in the industry. But I really didn't know a lot of what you explained today. And I just appreciate you taking the time to come join us to do that. So let's touch real quickly on what the future holds for you. And, and again, we said we would come back to film. You've got a role in that now. You want to keep doing it. So what's keeping you active now and where are you hoping to go? Well, fortunately, I still get to fly jets for giggles. And I did seven seasons with the Patriots jet team. Recently, I've been flying the Ace Maker T-33. Well, obviously not this year. There won't be a lot of flying for a while. Yeah. But I still get to scratch that itch, if you will, of being a, a jet pilot and an airship pilot, things I love. But a big, as I mentioned earlier, a big part of my life ambition was to become a filmmaker. And I would say almost 90% of what I do in the film is aviation related because I really want to share not just on the live stage with air show flying, but now I want to share on the big screen mm -hmm. and the small screen, my love of aviation. So I'm, I'm an aerial consultant and aerial coordinator. I direct a lot of flying scenes and movies, you know, some big movies, Netflix movies and whatnot. Actually, uh, if any, any of your listeners, I'm sure many have, have seen the Midway movie, I help Roland Emmerich uh, direct a lot of the flying scenes in that movie you know, on set and in post. So that was very rewarding. Awesome. Get to, you know, bring some history to the big screen again. I got out of the Air Force and I had a series on Discovery Channel I helped create and produce and I was talent in as, as a Patriots pilot called Air Show. And that got me going in the industry. And so all the lessons learned I've taken away from factual television with Discovery Channel and the movie industry now. I'm developing a couple more projects. I think I mentioned already that an IMAX movie, a giant screen movie about the Snowbirds jet team, yeah. very big interest. Uh, you know, I've already signed a distribution deal on that. So this is moving forward. This is going to happen. And uh, I have a new series that I host that uh, I'm going to venture in this new scary digital space that you've done very well in, in the podcasting world. And I'm going in the self-distributed world with this uh, digital series called Scratch Mitchell's Jet Fuel. And that's going to be coming out uh, quite likely on Amazon Prime and probably some content on a uh, YouTube channel as well. It's doing what you're doing. It's sharing our love of aviation to people. So that look for that coming around the corner uh, real soon. And in the meantime, uh, I'm developing some series 
uh, some really fun stuff that has aviation in it. You know, have a movie about a bush pilot survival story in the north. That's uh, you know a great story that I definitely want to make and direct this movie. So lots on my plate, but gets me up excited every day thinking about this stuff. No doubt. And you were generous enough to show me a couple of the early betas of the jet fuel, which I really enjoyed. So please let me know when those come out and we'll help to promote those best we can. And yeah, I'm just excited for you. It's such an amazing world. It's somewhat, I would argue, easier to do what I'm doing because you don't have to look good. You just have to sound good. And that took us a little while, but no, I applaud you. And uh, if there's ever a way we can overlap our two platforms to collaborate. This has been a lot of fun. It's been great getting to know you and I appreciate all your time today. Well, I'm going to throw it down right now. I think you need to come out and uh, we need to uh, have you on one of my episodes to see because one aspect of the series uh, I didn't explain is uh, you get insight into all the different touch points I have in aviation as an aerial pilot, mm. you know, behind the scenes and the movie making aspects uh, at times when I'm permitted to do that. But one of my side passions is I go in the wilderness, climb mountains and hike in the outback to find wrecked, abandoned World War II era airplanes in the 50s as well and tell their backstories as they're forgotten. They're like shipwrecks abandoned. I think I'd love to take you out on one of these adventures where we film it and a couple of fighter pods stumbling through the woods, yeah. seeing what we can find. Count on it, my friend. That sounds like a blast, except if you don't mind, I'm going to bring my six-piece uh, fly fishing rod that easy to transport in case we come across a trout stream because that's one of my passions and maybe I'll help feed us that yeah, way too. We might need that. <laughs> we might need that. <laughs> yeah, for real survival. But no, that sounds amazing and absolutely would love to collaborate in the future and maybe even bring you back now that you've been on the show and actually you've already been the guest co-host here too. So maybe we can have you back as the case may warrant, but this has been a lot of fun, Scratch. I appreciate it. So before we let you go, you know the drill. How did someone come up with Scratch? for Rob Mitchell. Uh, well, it's not my golf game. I'll say that to start with. <laughs> Probably closer to my billiards game. But when I was a baby fighter pilot, I was uh, sent to Bagotville, Quebec, which is a French base, French-Canadian base. And I was one of the test anglophones sent to the French squadron. And in my first week of combat readiness training, we had a French exchange officer from France. He asked me in French, because everything was briefed in French, and I had only had a modicum of French at the time, just functional. <laughs> and he asked me, avez-vous déjà fait de ravitaillement aérien? Which means, have you ever done air to air refueling? And I went, oui, once in training on a Hercules. <laughs> and so we blasted <laughs> off, lit the burners, and I see this big airplane in the sky. And I'm like, that doesn't look like a Hercules. And I went, oh, well. What are the chances that it's a different technique? Well, it's a pretty good chance it's a different technique. <laughs> and so it was a 707, and it was an entirely different technique to air to refuel on that. And I pasted the airplane. I scratched with this hard basket, nose to tail on the canopy. <laughs> I went and flew my mission, and I landed. And in my broken French, I told the ground crew, because uh, there was a big mark above my head uh, from head to toe uh -huh. of the canopy. And I said, in broken French, I said, you should be able to buff it out. And they came into the ready room and their eyes were wide open. They're like, dude, basically, you just about lost your head because it almost banana peeled on me. And uh, oh, gosh. And forevermore, I was the scratch man. So... <laughs> That's where they came from. That's my favorite part of this show is there's such great call signs out there. You know, they've got coffee table books on nose art from World War II. I don't know if I could do an equivalent, but I need like a coffee table book of great call sign stories. So uh, maybe we'll have to work on that together or a show or something. But Scratch, you're the man. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, you made my day. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. I do want to remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the host and my guest and do not necessarily represent present the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Scratch, I guess it's probably fair to say you don't speak for the Canadian government or military as well? That's exactly the same. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you back here next time on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Scratch, thanks again. Cheers. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube.
For exclusive Fighter Pilot podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show, and don't forget to share us with your network. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.